Okay, this is Dave Frazier. And this is an introduction to Python, uh, Python 3 in particular. So I'm not sure that I have my location as, as the final one. Uh, the lighting's a little rough. They're also working on our building, so there may be some background noise. I apologize for that. A couple of preliminaries before we get to the coding, as far as the tools that are going to be used in this video series. We're using an Anaconda uh, for our Python download that's available at Continuum, that's C-O-N-T-I-N-U-U-M dot I-O. We're using the Python 3 version. <laughs> As part of that, we're using the idle text editor. So the examples I use will be using idle, okay? The textbook that we're basing this on is called Think Python. It's available at greentreepress.com. Uh, from there, you can look for Think Python or just do a, a Google on Think Python. We're using uh, version 2E, which is for Python 3. Okay, so we're going to get started fairly quickly on some coding examples, so you won't have to look at me the whole time. But a couple of things up front. The first is that Python is an interpreted language. Okay, that means that it's not compiled. You can't ever have a program that you sell to someone that they can't read the code on. Okay, so Python is a scripting language, it's sometimes called, where the code that you write is going to be executed as, as you run it. It doesn't do any compiling in advance. Okay. Uh, that's probably a good thing for learning. I know way back when I learned to program on basic A, which was a version of the basic programming language that was interpreted as well. Okay. So as, as part of that, um, we're going to have both an interactive mode where we can see what's going on and then a scripted mode where we can save our work. Okay. So this is a programming class or a programming instruction. So the first question is, what's a program? Well, a program is nothing more than a sequence of instructions that you're going to give the computer to tell it to perform some computation. That computation could be calculating grades, uh, doing your taxes, finding out um, the, the surface of, of, of a triangle, surface area of a triangle or something, whatever you want to do. Lots of things there, okay? So most of the programs that we write are going to have some basic parts. It's going to allow for some input from somewhere. That input could be from the user, uh, where they type it into their keyboard. It could be from a sensor, uh, from a, you know, a temperature sensor. It could be from a camera, microphone, any of those things. Okay? There usually is going to be some output. You want there to be a result of your calculations where you want it to be able to uh, print, it, print something out or make a noise or change a graphic or something. Okay? There's often some kind of math involved. You're doing some kinds of computations or calculations. Uh, computers are very good at doing calculations, okay? Um, there will often be conditional execution, which means it's not going to do the exact same steps every time. There's going to be the possibility for there to be changes in conditions that have it follow one path or the other. We'll talk more about that later, okay? One of the other things that computers do very well is repetition. Something that, that we would do a couple times and be bored with, the computer can do all day and boredom is never a problem, okay? So the next thing we're going to talk about are the types of errors that you're likely to run into. The good news about programming, if your program doesn't work, it is your fault I'm pointing at you there. Okay? I think that's very freeing, which means that you can fix it. So the computer does exactly what you tell it to do, nothing more, nothing less. So if it doesn't work, you have to figure out why. So these errors come in three varieties. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first variety is a syntax error. Those are the easiest to deal with. It means that you have violated the grammar of the language. So in Python, the print function is a small p. If you would type print with a, a capital P, it would, the interpreter would say you can't do that. Okay? So syntax errors are going to be caught by either the interpreter or the compiler in a compiled language. So you'll never have code that you turn in or that you release to the world that has syntax errors. It's not possible. The second kind of error is a runtime error. A runtime error occurs when some condition during the execution of the program causes there to be an error condition. Okay, so it, it will compile just fine, it will run just fine in many cases, but there are cases where it will not. So a good example here is if you're asking the user for two numbers and you try to divide the first by the second. That works all the time until it comes up that the second number is a zero, then it gives you a division by zero error. Okay. The only way to adequately deal with runtime errors are to, to test. We'd like to test for what we call boundary conditions. Really big numbers, zero, really small numbers, things like that. Okay. 
Uh, the third kind of error is called a semantic error or a logical error, and they're the most difficult to catch. A semantic error occurs when you don't understand how to do what you're trying to do, okay? So when you don't understand, or I guess you understand, you think you understand, but you don't, you're going to have errors in your code, and when you test it, it's going to work the way you believe, which is not correct. So a simple example there is, is if you believe that you get the square root of a number uh, by dividing it by two, that is incorrect. But if you think that, you're going to write your program to do that, you're going to write your test cases to test for that, and you will think life is good when it is not. The only way to avoid semantic errors is to have somebody else look at your code. Hopefully you can find an expert in the field to help you deal with that, okay? So let's write our first program, okay? If, if, if you are taking a physical class with me, which many of you are, we've already done this, but, but if not, let's go ahead and, and, and do this anyway, okay? So I'm going to have to move here to the screen share, which should pop up here, okay? I can now go over to the idle window. And where we're at now, we're in idle, and it says at the top, Python 3.5.2 shell. And what you really notice here is that you have the three greater than signs. Those three greater than signs let you know that we're in the interactive Python shell, okay? So we want to write an actual program and not use the interactive shell. So let's go ahead and go through the steps to create um, an actual program, okay? So I'm gonna go to the file menu here, and I'm gonna click on new file. You can also do a control N. This pops up a new window. This is where I can type my program, okay? So we're gonna type the ubiquitous hello world program, okay? So print is a function, has the parentheses there. We then put something inside of single quotes. You can also use double quotes, just don't use both. That's it, that's gonna be our program. That's gonna print hello world to the screen, okay? We need to save this, so we go to the file menu again, come down to save. Ask this for a name, let's just call this hello.ui, which I already have. Yes, let me go ahead and replace it, you won't get that problem. Okay, so once I've done that, I want to run the program. So I go to the run menu, and I come down to run module. Okay, when I do that, it takes a second, it goes, back to the Python shell, it executes my code, and there we have Hello World on the screen, okay? So that's our first program. So we're gonna talk about some other concepts here, okay? The first thing we need to talk about are variables. Now, if you have a math background, then we know what a variable is in math, right? A variable is an unknown. If X is a variable, we're looking for X. Variables in programming, and this is true not just in Python, are a little bit different. Variables are not unknowns. Variables can better be called labels because a variable is gonna be something that we use to refer to some value, okay? So we can have different kinds of variables. Uh, the variable names themselves can be letters and numbers uh, as long as you want. There's no practical limit. You don't want a 300 character uh, label or variable name that wouldn't work very well, but you do wanna be descriptive enough that people know what you're doing here, okay? So, we can say something like X is equal, but that's an equal sign, but I really shouldn't say equal. In Python, as in other C-derived programming languages, a single equals symbol is the assignment. So I'm not saying X is equal to something, I'm saying X is assigned the value of seven, okay? So we, I will say X equals seven, as people will, but that is incorrect. This is really saying X is assigned the value of seven. So X is no longer the unknown. X is a label that points to the value seven, okay? So our variables can hold various things, and each of those things can have a type. So if we use the type on that variable, we will see that a seven is an int or an integer. An integer is a number with no decimal portion, okay? If I would reassign, which I can do, X to something like 7.0, you will find the class is float. A float is a number that has a decimal portion, okay? We can also do strings. A string would be something like, I could put either single or double quotes. I can put some series of letters or numbers or spaces or whatever I want. 
Okay, and then if I do a type again on that, So we use these variables to hold values, okay? Uh, the values are of some type. If you're familiar with other programming languages, you may find that this is, is, this is breaking your mind, okay? Other languages are what we call strongly typed in that the variable x, when it's declared, and it has to be declared, is of a certain type. And if you put it on a different type, it's going to cause trouble, okay? Python doesn't have that. Python's what we call a loosely typed language which means the, the type of the variable is going to depend on what you put in it. Okay, so if you put an integer into x, x is of type integer. If you put um, a, a float into type x, it's of type float, okay? So that's both good and bad. There are positives and negatives to how you do that, okay? So um, you just have to, to keep that in mind, that it's a safety feature in some languages, but it gives us a little bit of flexibility. does that for us. So when, when you're choosing your variable names, again, they have to contain letters and numbers. Uh, they can't start with a letter. Uh, 1A is not a valid variable name. Um, A is okay, okay? Again, you want to name them something meaningful. I've been using X, probably not a good idea, okay? If you're tracking someone's age, use age for the variable. It could be uppercase or lowercase, but by convention, we do variable names in lowercase. Okay. If you have multiple words in your, uh, in your name, for example, or in your variable name, let's say you want to keep track of someone's first name. Okay. I can either, let me see where I'm typing in at, go back to here. I can type in first name like that. That's called a camel cap. You see that the, 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 Every word, its first letter is capitalized except the first word, okay? People sometimes also use the underscore. Either of those are fine. Uh, it just depends on, on what it is that, that you like to see, okay? On my Mac, so Control Plus doesn't do anything. Let's see, I may have to... Options. Let's see if I can do something in here. I should have thought of that first, shouldn't I? But apparently I didn't. Yeah. Okay, hopefully that's better to see. Okay, so again, the name can have either the camel caps, where every subsequent word has its first letter capitalized, or you can put in um, the underscores between them. That's all okay, okay? And again, you want to make them your, your variable names as short as possible without being too short. Um, when you're doing the coding, you'll know what you mean. But if you go away from it a while and come back, there could be trouble. Or if somebody else is looking at your code, it can be difficult, okay? So once we have these variables, uh, we want to be able to do some things with them, right? So we have our operators, okay? So the operators here, we'll start with the arithmetic operators. Let me go ahead and close out of this one. I don't want to save that. I should be able to go back. Okay, so I'm back to the interactive mode, okay? So we have our normal operators to do addition and subtraction and multiplication and division, and those look as the following. The plus sign, I bet I need to change this as well. Is that already big? No, that made it bigger. Okay, sorry, I'm talking to myself, it happens sometimes. Okay, so to do a plus, I can just say, and I can use the, the interpreter, uh, the interpreter cell as calculator. Three plus four is seven, as we would expect, okay? I can also do three minus two and get one, just a regular minus symbol. Division is a little bit problematic in Python. Let me show you why. In Python 2, some of you I know may be familiar with Python 2, if we would say three slash two, three is an integer, two is an integer, or the result of this division would also be an integer. So three text, three slash two would equal one. Caused a lot of confusion. So in Python three, you see that the division now is gonna convert the answer to a float of 1.5, okay? Which makes sense to us and what we expect, but it's a little bit different. 
If you want it to perform the old way, you do two slash. Three slash slash two gives you what Python two used to give. Okay. Multiplication, we do just with a star. Okay, so we can say five times seven. It's going to give us the result. Okay. So those are all pretty normal. We can also do exponentiation here. I can say four star star two gives us four squared. Okay. Um, the order of operations is what we always do, okay, which means that parentheses happen first. Okay, so if you put in parentheses, you can change the normal order of execution. If not, it's going to do exponentiation first, and then uh, multiplication and division, and then finally addition, sorry, multipli yes, multiplication, division, and then finally addition and subtraction from left to right. Okay, so all that's the same in Python, okay? So the other symbol we're gonna talk about that is more useful than you can ever imagine is the modulus op operator. Okay, what the modulus does, it's going to take two integers, one on the left side, one on the right side, two operands, we call them. Okay, it's gonna return, when you divide the first by the second, what is the remainder? Okay, so going back to our three divided by two, I can do three mod, we usually say, and that's the percent sign, two, it's going to give us that remainder of one. Okay, and that again turns out to be far more uh, useful than you would imagine at first glance. Okay, so the other thing that we can do with our operators <coughs> is that we can operate on strings in some ways. Okay, uh, the string operators are a little strange and they don't always do what we expect. They don't all work, but we can do a couple. So for example, I could do something like a string bird that could be a value as it is here or a variable that equals bird. I can add a string. When you do that, it's called concatenation, and it's going to just put them together, no spaces. Okay, so there are times when that can be useful when you're building things. You can also use the multiplication as as a repeat. Okay, so I could say something like three times. This one's probably less useful, but you know, it comes up sometimes. Okay. So again, the modules are gonna come in handy in lots of ways. Okay, I think the, the first, the, the, the most we need for, we can check to see if something is even or not. Okay, so if I ask the user for a number and I wanna know if it's even or odd, I can do the mod two. If a number is even, by definition, it is evenly divisible by two. So if we do the number they enter, mod two and get a zero, we know the number's even. If we get a one, we know the number's odd. Okay, so it does come in handy. Okay, um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is expressions and statements. So an expression is gonna be some combination of values, variables, and operators. Okay, so again, a value is seven. Okay, a variable, variable would be, if we say x is assigned the value of seven, now x is a variable. That, that has the value currently of seven. So we put those together with operators, something like I could say y is equal to x plus three, okay? And that is a, as a, that's an expression, okay? In this case, it's gonna assign the value <coughs> of y to be whatever x was plus three more. In this case, y would be equal to 10, okay? So, Expressions go together to make what we call statements in Python, okay? A statement is simply a line of code. So this y is equal to x plus three is also a statement in this case, okay? We can add more to it if we need to, okay? Okay, so let's see what else we wanna talk about. Oh, the other thing that's important here is that we can add comments to our code. Okay, so let's again go back. This time we're gonna open a program we've already done. We're going to open our Hello World program, okay? should be in this directory since I didn't tell it to change directories. Let's see. But I don't see it, which is very strange. Yeah, there it is. It's my problem, not its. Okay, so I'm gonna open the program. And you should find um, a folder somewhere on your hard drive to store all your programs, uh, maybe by chapter if you want, or, or whatever. It just makes it easier to, to do here, okay? So comments are useful in a couple of ways. 
the first thing they can they can be a way to 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 put some notes in there okay so you can put something like this is my first program You can put your name. If the program's at all confusing, you can put in other information. If you're using any algorithms, any formulas, you can put all that in there, okay? You can put comments anywhere along the way, okay? You can put comments to let you know, this is a tricky part of code, this is what I'm doing here, okay? Uh, you, you, the comments, again, are there for you uh, later as you're looking at the program, or if anybody else looks at the code later, okay? The other thing you can do, if you have somewhere, some line, this line would not cause you any trouble. But well, let's say that, let's do one that may. Let's say we have here something like um, the, um, let's say x is equal to t divided by b, assuming that t and b both have values, okay? So when you run the code, it blows up on this line and you don't know why, okay? The, the y is probably you're dividing by zero. But we can go through and put this little octothorpe or hashtag or pound sign, whatever you wanna call that, uh, it, it's shift three on my keyboard. If you put that in front of a line, that line no longer executes. Okay, so it can let you know which line may be causing your trouble. Okay, so that's an important thing to do. Okay, so that's the, the real basic, basic structure of the Python language. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on and do some more advanced features. Okay, so I'm not sticking, sticking strictly to the book chapters, so that you may find that I'm not sure what chapter we're in, but I think we're moving to a different one. The next thing we're gonna talk about are functions, okay? So functions, functions have a specific meaning in math, okay? That's not the same meaning as we have in programming. They're similar, kind of like the variables. Similar, but with some differences. So functions, what we're talking about here is gonna be a named sequence of statements, okay? We gather some statements together, we give them a name, call them a function. Uh, it can accept parameters, it can return arguments, uh, re can return values and all that stuff, but it's a way to group things together, okay? So you're gonna call this function once you define it by giving its name, giving whatever parameters that it takes, okay? Parameters, information you're sending into the program, okay? Um, and then it's gonna give whatever results that it does, okay? So, um, you're going to, to put these functions inside of there. It's going to, we say that the function takes a parameter and it's going to return a result. Okay, we've already seen a couple of these. The print that we've done, in fact, it's on the screen right here, is an example of a function. The print function takes the parameter of a string or a variable that points to something, okay? It then prints that out onto the screen for us. We've also seen the type function you send it a value or a variable and it returns what the type of that currently is, okay? So again, these are, these are very useful um, things to do here, okay? So here are some functions that, that we're eventually gonna get to, we're building our own, but let's talk about some of the useful uh, built-in functions there are with Python, okay? The first are gonna be some type conversion programs, okay? If you have something, type of X is a string because it's around the quotes, but it looks like a number. Okay, so we can try to convert this. There's a function called int. If we say int X, okay, and we could say something like X is now assigned the value of int times X. If we do that, X is now the int 32, okay? This will make it permanent. I could also use it and say something like some new variable Y equal to int x plus okay. This would evaluate the int x first, change that to 32, it would then add five to it and assign 37 to y. Okay. So um, if you would try it on something that it can't deal with, like Bob, okay, it would return an error, okay. Note that if we tried to convert something like quote 3.4, it would just lop off that decimal portion. It doesn't round. So 3.9, for example, y would be equal to exactly eight, okay? Because it, the int is gonna wipe out that, that decimal portion, okay? You can do rounding, but that's a different way, okay? So those are some of the built-in functions. 
But the way Python is organized is through a series of libraries, tons of libraries. The libraries are built in, many of them. You can download extras, but there are plenty that just come with it. Okay? They're not included in every program, because if you don't need them, you don't want to make the size of the program any bigger. But one of the big ones is called the math library. Or to, uh, to bring it in physically, we don't have to download it. It's already there with our Python. Okay. But we do have to say import. That's it. It's gonna, all of those math functions are now available to us. Okay, and you can go online. Uh, Python.org is the main website. It's going to give you a list of all of the math functions that are there. Okay, so that that's all going to be a good thing. Okay, so we can do this in our program. We can also do it just here in our. In the interactive mode. So when, once I import math here, I can type it correctly, which apparently I can. I now have access to all of this. Okay. So the math library includes a bunch of functions built in for us. It also includes some basic values. So the value of pi, if you don't want to just guess at it, if you want to get more decimal places than you may know, for example, I can just do something like this. I can just math dot pi, okay? And it gives us pi to however many decimal places it can hold, okay? Which I think is the maximum for Python. If you're going to uh, send a spacecraft to, to Mars or build a bridge, I don't know that Python has enough uh, sensitivity to really small numbers, okay? But it's, it's certainly fine for most of what we're going to do with it. And Python is an extremely popular programming language, okay? So by typing in math pi, it gives me all of that information, okay? Uh, which is stored there. So that's a constant we can use. There's some other functions here. Uh, for example, there's a square root function. So I can say uh, math.sqrt and give it the number four. It's going to return two. Okay. Um, there are other functions here. You can do an exponent functions um, or exponential functions. You can do log functions. All kinds of stuff. Sine, cosine's all there, so I can do a math dot sine of 45 if I wanted. And again, two things here. You have to import math. If you have it, it gives you an error. You also can't just say sine. It's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. The name sine, or sin in this case, is not defined. Okay. That's more of a religious question, whether sin is defined or not, but in our case, it's not going to work. And again, Python's pretty good. If you've ever programmed in C, the, the languages here, are, or the, the error messages here are much friendlier. It's telling us that there's a name error and exactly where that error occurs, okay? I will tell you it's true in all programming languages that often, if you have a long program, if it says there's an error on line 25, check line 24, that may be where the error is actually occurring, okay? So again, there are lots of functions built in that we can use. There are lots of math functions we can use. We can also define our own functions. And we don't know a lot of coding, so our function is going to be fairly trivial at this point, but, but we can do it. Okay, so let's go through how this is going to work. Okay, so we're going to define it here in the interactive shell, but you can do this just the same in a program that probably even makes more sense. We start with the keyword def. Okay, I didn't say this about variable names, but let me go back and say that. You cannot name a variable a reserved keyword in Python. And your textbook has a list of those keyword words. Anything we use, such as def, such as while, which we'll use later, things like that, if those cannot be variable names. Okay, so we're going to define a function. Next comes the function name. We're going to call it print lyrics. Okay, we're going to keep with the, uh, the Monty Python reference theme here. Okay, and we're going to put um, the two parentheses. If we were sending any parameters to this function, like with the square root, we sent the integer for it, but it'll also work with floats. In this case, we're not. We're not going to send any in, okay? Then we put a colon there. The colon tells Python that we're going to do a, a compound block, okay? So there are going to be lines to follow, okay? Then we hit enter. You note that it indents over. Now, when you're in the uh, interpretive mode, it's not a big deal on the indentations. When you're in the uh, script mode, you have to make sure that you indent things properly. Okay, I suggest using the tab key rather than tabbing over. 
Python is crazy for indentation, okay? Other languages use curly brackets, other things. Python uses indentation to know when you're inside of a block and when you're not, okay? So be really careful. It will give you an indentation error if you don't do it correctly, okay? So in this case, we're simply going to print out, use our print function. Lumberjack. I'm okay. Again, and now it keeps us indented. So I'm going to do the second line here. Sleep hard to type and lecture. Sleep all night and I work. Okay. That's enough of that. You hit enter one more time on a blank line, and now it takes us back to the prompt. Okay, the three greater than signs. So we've now defined that function, okay? It takes no parameters, it doesn't return anything, but it does cause something to happen. It's gonna print these lines out, okay? To call this, I just say, print underscore, all the back the same way, lyrics. The parentheses show it's a function. If I do that, boom. It So as far as naming things, this first slide with the, 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 the def in it, we call that the function header. The rest of the function we call the function body, okay? And again, we could do that just the same in our, uh, inter, our uh, script mode as we did in the interactive mode. So no difference is there, okay? Okay, so the flow of execution when you're doing a program is interesting. Okay, so let's take an example back over here. Let's say that we're back in interactive mode. So normally what's going to happen on your program, we'll just use math for example, okay? Um, when you say import math, or if we say our defined function, okay, so we're gonna call this, um, let's do one double it, which takes some number x. And what we're gonna do is print to when we're executing a Python program, the, the flow of execution normally starts at the beginning, it goes down every line, and that's it. It doesn't interrupt it unless there's a reason to. When it sees we're defining a function, it makes note internally where in memory that function is, and then it moves on, it doesn't do anything. So if my program here just says print hello world again, the flow of execution of our program is as follows. It sees the first line, it sees that it's a comment, it ignores it. It moves on to the import math, it now imports the math library, but that's it, it doesn't do anything. It sees that we're defining a function called double it. Doesn't do anything with that. It just makes note of it and it moves on. It now prints hello world, then it exits. Okay, so our function is never called. The flow is normal here. But if I then say print double it four. Okay, so I'm sending the result of the double it program or the function to the print statement. If I do that, then it's going to do, just like I said, it's going to print hello world. When it gets to the print line, the first thing it's going to do, it's going to take a detour. It's going to, when it sees the double it, it's going to go to the double it function. It's going to assign X in double it, the value of four. It's going to print four times, two times four, and then it's going to be done. It's going to go back to where it was, okay? Back to where the blinking cursor is, okay? So let's see if this works. Hopefully it does. I do all of my programming uh, examples live and sometimes things happen. I think this will work. Okay, it did. Okay. I'll notice it says none. We'll have to look into that. But it does say hello world. It does correctly give us eight. And then it gives us none. I'm not sure why the none's there. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, I'm not sure why there's a none there. It's very interesting. Um, we won't worry about that for now. We'll come back to that later. But you see that the, the execution of the code takes a detour, okay? 
if I would then do the same thing again, okay, so let me copy these lines of code down here, okay, it would then go down in a line to the first hello world, then on the print double it, it would then stop what it's doing, move to the double it function, do that, come back, print hello world again, go to the double it function one more time, sitting at a four again, print it out, and then come back. Okay, so the execution is going to go back and forth uh, between um, the, your main code and your function code. Okay, but remember that just defining a function doesn't change anything. It doesn't actually execute that until you tell it to. Okay, and we're also here using an example in the doublet function of a parameter. The parameter is x. X can be anything. Okay, whatever you tell it to send. Okay, one thing to note though is that if I would down here say, where I think I am, if I were to say, okay, let's see what happens here. Let me save this again. Let me run it. F5 will run it. Okay. It gives me a name error. X is not defined. Well, X is defined right up here, right? Wrong. Okay. Variables that are declared inside of a block, any block, in this case a function, do not have what we call scope or don't have visibility outside of that. Okay, so X has no meaning outside of the, the function. If I were to say up here, well, I'm, doing that, I'm printing two times X, so at, at, at this line inside of doublet, X has value. Outside of that, it does not, okay? So it's important to keep track of those visibility. And again, uh, this function, the doublet function, returns a result, okay, which, which means that we're going to perform some calculation and send something back, okay? Note that if I just did the following, There's no error there. It's going to print hello world. It's going to print out the result of sending four to double it. It's going to print hello world again. It won't print a blank line there, by the way, because I'm not really telling it to. Blank lines in your code don't mean anything uh, to the interpreter. When I call the double it with a four, that's all valid, except that it, it returns the eight that doesn't do anything with it. Okay, so you have to, I could save it as a variable. That would be okay. A, y is equal to double it four, okay, that's valid, um, or it's useful. The other was valid, this wasn't useful. And then I can print y, that's okay. So you have to do something with it. I think of kind of like, it produces something, you've got to either print it or, or save it as a variable, okay? okay? Other functions are called void functions. Uh, they don't return anything, okay? Our Lyric program, print lyrics, was a void function. Okay, uh, the book calls functions that return something fruitful functions. You see that sometimes other places as well. So we can recall, we can call functions that have a return value uh, fruitful functions. Okay, they do something. Okay. Um, so, hey, actually, does that work? Let's see, let's see if this works. I may be telling you something wrong. I always like to make mistakes because it's sometimes a learning experience. That, um, that's kind of an oddity because I'm, I'm used to, I, I program in many languages, I teach many languages. Uh, you don't have to uh, return that exp expressly, apparently. We're, just, we're making a change there. Okay. So it did work. Okay. So um, where are we in my notes? So the next thing we're going to talk about. So we've talked about the flow of execution. And again, we're moving quickly through a lot of topics today, through a bunch of chapters. Okay. So and I tend to talk really fast sometimes. I'll try to slow myself down. Um, we're talking about different basic features of Python. We're now going to talk about the conditional of, of execution. Okay, so the normal flows from top to bottom with no changes. But oftentimes, based on what's happening in your program at the time, we may want to run this code versus that code. Okay, so that's the next thing we're going to talk about. So to do that, we have to figure out some relational operators. These are operators we haven't talked about before, okay? These operators are going to allow us to determine some logical condition, okay?
Okay, so before we talk about that, let's talk about Boolean values. Uh, Boolean values are either true or false. They're named after George Boole, who developed this whole idea of Boolean algebra and all kinds of logic stuff. So again, just using my idle screen here as a whiteboard, let's say. In Python, true with a capital T, if you notice, just turned orange. I don't know if you caught that, okay? Um, that means that it's a reserved word and it is the Boolean value for true. Okay, note that true in lowercase letters is nothing. Okay, so it's important. So uh, Boolean values are true or false. That's it. Can't be anything else. Okay, so these relational operators, we can have as well uh, Boolean variables. So if I say something like x is, is assigned the value of true, Okay, and then do a type. Okay. So here, if I say x is equal to true, I'll say a type x. Okay, you return the Boolean value. Okay. So we're going to use those in a second, but let's first talk about the operators. So we keep saying that a single equal sign is not a Boolean, uh, is not, uh, sorry, is not equality. It's an assignment. What is equality is two equal signs. Okay, so if I say something like five equals equals five, it's going to return the Boolean value of true. Okay, the other operators we have here, I could say something like five not equal, that's exclamation point equal, not equal to five, false. Okay, simple enough. I can do a greater than, I can say five is greater than two returns a true. I can do a greater than or equal to. Five is greater than or equal to 10. False. Okay. There's also a less than, as you would imagine. I can use variables too, but I don't know what x is anymore. So let's say five is less than 20. Say five is less than or equal to 12, and it returns if five is less than or equal to one, the spaces are there for my convenience, so I have to be there. It gives you a false. Okay? So those are what we have. We have the equal to, not equal to, greater than, we have the uh, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Okay? Note that for the greater than, equal to, less than or equal to, we don't have a key for our, the cool things we do in math where we combine them together, so we do greater than, equal to in sequence. Okay? So when you have one of these uh, Boolean expressions, we call them, or logical expressions, with logical operators, they're going to return either a true or false, okay? So again, we could do this with variables just as easily. I could say, you know, the value of seven, and y is assigned the value of seven as well. And then if I say x is equal to y, it's going to return a true. Okay. Um, I would say something like x is equal to 7 point, or y equals 7.0, and then say x is equal, equal to, it's still true. Okay, so it does that automatic conversion from the float to the, which is a good thing. So in addition to our logical operators, we also have um, some ways to do these compound things, okay, compound logical operations. And that's going to be with the and, the or, and the not. And they work pretty much like you would expect them to work in English. Okay. So, for example, I could say something like x, which is currently, uh, what? Currently 7. If I say x is greater than 0, and, again, lowercase and, x is less than 10. Okay. All of that returns a true because both conditions are true. Okay, the or works by taking, uh, only one of them has to be true. So if we can say x is greater than zero, or x is greater than one, the logical thing I've ever said, okay? That's true because the x is greater than zero is true, even though the other side is not, okay? The not just negates whatever it is. So if you have x greater than zero being 
typed in correctly, x greater than zero being true, then not x greater Um, you often see uh, programmers, me as well, put parentheses around our logical conditions uh, just because I think it, it makes it easier uh, to read. So I could say something like um, B is equal to X equal equal Y. Okay, perfectly valid, pretty weird looking. Let's break this down. We're saying I'm assigning to the variable B the result of testing if x is equal to y. Okay. So then if I would print, it would print true. Okay. Is x equal to y? Oh yeah, because we changed it. Yes, okay. So that's kind of weird syntax. So I think it looks better to say something like okay. So we now have the basics of how we're gonna deal with these conditional statements we can go through and specify how to do conditional execution. We're gonna do this with what we call an if statement, the if structure, okay? That, that it's gonna start with the if, and it gets more complicated. And this is pretty basic. Okay? So this is gonna be another compound structure. We're going to say if some condition, if X is greater than zero, let's say, okay? And then just like with our functions, this is a compound statement, it's gonna be a block of statements. We have to put a colon to let everybody know that we're dealing with, with when you're on the interactive mode, it automatically indents for you. If you're typing up your own, you may have to do that yourself, okay? So in this case, we're just gonna say print, x is positive. If x is greater than zero, this line and all the other lines that are indented to this level are going to, um, to execute, okay? So if I put another print, hello, I'm still part of that if, okay? Oh, I just gave the error there and messed up my whole world by putting in one single quote, one double quote. Can't do that. You gotta pick one or the other, okay? So that's a problem. But that print line, if I would have typed it incorrectly, would have been part of that if structure, okay? Do as many lines as you want. Okay, so that's the simplest version. You can have alternative versions, if you like, with the if else, okay? So for the if else, um, you're gonna say basically something like, let's go back to this window here. I can say something like, all of this, get a clean slate here. Okay, so I can say x is equal to six, say, I is assigned the value of five, okay? I can say if x is greater than y, for example, colon, print, x is bigger than y. I can write the backspace and do it else, it's our second option. So what do I know? If X is not bigger than Y, it is either less than or equal to. Okay, so I can just say here, print X is less. Yeah. So it's important to note, one of those two statements will execute, and no more. Okay, so even if I, um, were to change things that would cause other problems, it, and I'll show that in a more involved example here, it's always going to pick only one. Okay? It's like if you have a coin sorter. Okay? If the first hole is a quarter, then every dime falls in the quarter hole and, and nothing ever hits the dime hole. Okay, so you have to be careful when you're doing these. The next thing we're gonna do are, are these chained uh, conditionals. So a chain conditional would be something like, if X is greater than Y, do something. ELIF, some other condition. X is less than Y. In that case, we're going to print X less than Y. Okay, and that's all we're doing there. And then down here, we're going to say, we can now say that X 
is equal to one. So again, only one of those is going to print. Because of the else, one of them definitely will print. If you just have an if, then it may or may not print. Okay, but the else means if nothing else, if all else fails, hit that one. Okay, so what we can't do, or it wouldn't affect us any. Okay, right now, x is greater than y is true. But if I would say y is equal um, to 100, right here, okay, here's how the flow is going to go. It hits the if x equal to y, that's true. It's going to print x is bigger than y. It's going to change the value of y to 100, okay? It's not going to evaluate the else if, which is now true as well, okay? Because I've changed the value of y. It's not going to evaluate the else. No matter what, once it falls into one of these holes, the next thing it does is execute the line beyond the conditional where my blinking cursor is, okay? So that, that's how that works. You can have as many else ifs as you want uh, to, to make whatever point you need to make, okay, whatever you're trying to do. Uh, you can have, with, you can do, do this with strings. Uh, if you're giving people options, you know, A, B, C, D, you can say if uh, C is equal to A, do this. If C is equal to B, do else if C is equal to B, do that. L if, you know, it's equal to C, whatever, and else at the bottom. Make those as complicated as you need, okay? And then the last thing we're going to cover today is that you can also do nested conditionals. Nested conditionals means that you have one conditional statement inside of another one, okay? So we're going to kind of redo what we just did, okay? So we're going to say, um, let's just actually delete all this and we'll start over. We're going to say, if x is equal to y to begin with, is important. This does the automatic indentation, but make sure you don't change that. So again, we're going to print. For brevity's sake, I'm just going to say equal. I'm now going to say else. Okay. So if they're equivalent, which in this case they're not, it's going to print equal and drop out of the whole thing, go to the next line that's not connected to this. Okay. But I, in my else, I'm going to have another if. I'm going to say if x is greater than y. Okay, this, this if is nested in the other if. Okay, it's now indented one further level. Okay, so I can now say print greater than y the first way here. Okay, I can now have an else here where I print. This does the same thing with different print statements as we did before, okay? So if the first if is true, it prints equal and it drops down to where the cursor is blinking, okay? If it's not equal, it then applies this second test, if x is greater than y. If that's true, it's gonna print greater and then drop to where the cursor's at. If not, it's going to print less and drop to where the cursor's at, okay? This does exactly what we did before with different print statements, okay? Uh, again, the indentation is important. I will say it many times. Python is crazy for indentations, okay? Uh, if I put a statement, you know, print hello, and I'm not in Python 2 anymore. Not Python 2 for a lot of years sometimes. At this point, that print statement will be executed no matter what happens in the conditional. Okay, it's part of no block, okay? If I indent it one time here, then that print statement is part of the bigger if else, okay? It's part of the else part of that if else. So if X is equal to Y, hello will not print, okay? Now, no matter what X and Y are doing, hello prints. Now, it will only print if x is not equal to y, okay? It will print whether it's greater or, e or less, doesn't matter, okay? Now, <clears throat> the print hello is part of the less branch of the second conditional. Hello prints now only when x is less than y. All indentation, okay? So I think that's, that, that's, that's it for now. Uh, just to say, that 
This second nested conditional, um, nested conditionals are extremely vital. Sometimes they're, they're the only thing you can do, but in this case, they're unnecessary. You know, I think that, that this nested adds more complexity and doesn't really give us anything additional, okay? So in this case, I wouldn't do it this way. Okay, it works fine, no problem. It proved the point or showed the code, but whenever possible, you want your programs to be as simple as possible, but not simpler, okay? You can't make a program more simple than it can be or it doesn't work, okay? So I think that's it. Let me stop the screen share here. Should take us back to the main screen, yes. So um, that roughly covered, I want to say, I think, I don't have the book with me, the first five chapters of the Think Python book, okay? So these series of lectures are not going to be um, standalone per se. I'm going to refer to that book a lot, but I will try to give other insight, uh, other examples of things uh, that, 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 um, that may be useful, okay? I've programmed for a long time, taught for a long time, and sometimes I have different insights than the book would have, okay? So, um, Again, my name is David Frazier. I'm a professor of computer science at Tusculum College. And if you have any questions, you can contact me at dfrazier, D-F-R-A-Z-I-E-R, at Tusculum, T-U-S-C-U-L-U-M, dot E-D-U. And there will be more to come.